everyone. This is Richard Hanania of the CSPI podcast. I'm here today with uh, John Mueller. John, how are you? I'm doing just fine. Great. So, John, uh, uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a political scientist. At, uh, I was at the University of Rochester. Now I'm at Ohio State. And I'm also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington. And my interests have been mainly in international relations. So I've done a few other things, including write a book, writing a book about Fred Astaire. Won a prize, even. Oh, really? Wow. A man of many, a man of many talents. I could not imagine. Uh, you know, my, my academic work is, you know, is, is overwhelming enough. I couldn't imagine to take it out of an eccentric uh, uh, hobby like that. So uh, that's, a, that's impressive. Yeah, I just got interested in dance at one time and eventually discovered a stair and taught courses on a stair, in fact, in his choreography. And then it uh, became a book. Yeah. Enough. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's amazing. So, yeah, okay. I, I didn't know that, but uh, your okay. latest book... <laughs> That was just came out uh, last month was called uh, the stupidity of war, and mm-hmm. you're you're a political scientist, and I'm I'm also a uh, I'm also a political scientist. I did my uh, graduate work in IR, and I you know I, I think that when we think about IR theory, uh, like before we get to the book, I, I I'm interested in reading your work because in this book in particular, but some of your other work too, you don't really approach the field in sort of the standard ways. One, one thing I like about your book um, and I like about your uh, uh, you know, your way of approaching international relations is I think when you write a book called The Stupidity of War, and I, I you know I had these debates with other people in the field, it's, it's sort of offensive, I think, to the uh, spirit of the discipline. Um, I feel that a lot of people I talk to about these things, they're, uh, uh, you know, they're sort of committed to the idea of rationality as sort of the cornerstone of our discipline. And so the idea is, you know, there has to be a reason for what the country is doing. And I think if you're going to summarize your book, and you, you know, you could tell me if I'm, if I'm, uh, uh, if you wouldn't put it the same way, it's that basically we've been doing uh, a lot of things for a long time in international relations in the U.S. for what are essentially not good reasons. Uh, we could basically have brought the troops home after World War II, and we could have basically done nothing uh, for b- most of that time. And we probably would have been better off for it. So is, is is that would you think that's an accurate summary of your book? And if so, could you talk a little bit about how sort of that's, uh, you know, how sort of that accords or sort of contradicts with the field of IR and how most scholars approach, approach these questions? Uh, yeah, I'm glad to. Uh... I, I think the book, I think I think of the book as sort of a biography of an idea, and the idea is that war is really stupid. Now, I, I start out with the Greek and the Greek and uh, Trojan War, you know, which lasted 10 years, uh, was fought over an errant wife, and ended up in the total destruction of Troy. And you'd think somebody after that would say, that was really stupid. <laughs> right. But no one did. Uh, Shakespeare actually has a, uh, an anti-war play called Troilus and Cressida, in which he has one of his characters essentially say that. But it's, it's you know, quite. Uh, uh, I've, I've got a quote from Norman Schwarzkopf, for example, saying that war is basically an obscenity because when you're you know, international, we're talking about international war here, um, and uh, you've got two countries fighting it out uh, by you know trying to solve an argument by basically killing as many of the others they can. And it's basically absurd, uh, or as he calls it, an obscenity, or as, or as uh, Eisenhower also called it, a, tra- a, a tragedy and, a, uh, and, stu- and stupid. Um, but uh, in looking at it historically, you can find individual people who have been opposed to war at various places, uh, uh, you know, various philosophers sitting on rocks and things, and you can see the Quakers and so forth. But the sort of a consensual idea that war was really stupid really took flower basically in Europe and the offshoots of Europe after World War I. And so I'm sort of tracing that idea. It's, it's not particularly clear why World War I uh, embell- caused that idea to be so much embellished, uh, because it clearly um, it wasn't the first stupid war by any means. It was a very disgusting war, but mud and dysentery and, and syphilitic prostitutes were not invented in 1914. Um, it was, uh, and, but, but before that war, there was, the only thing that's really unique about that war is that uh, before, it would, before it took place, there was a small uh, gadfly peace movement. First time in history, there's been people jumping up and down saying, let's get rid of war. They're considered to be basically nutcases for the most part. 
uh, gradually, uh, with, with the war taking place, suddenly they were in the majority, uh, in Europe in particular. Um, so that uh, starting then, there was basically the idea of how do we get rid of war? It's really a bad thing. It's, stu- it's obviously stupid. It's obviously incredibly destructive. We want to get rich instead. Uh, and it's a good way of documenting this. Uh, be- before, before World War I, let me just give you a list of some of the things that people have said about war. And it's amazingly easy, be- easy before World War I to see, hear, see people say this. Uh, war is beautiful, horrible. Uh, on, beautiful, honorable, holy, sublime, heroic, ennobling, natural, glorious, cleansing, necessary, progressive, and redemptive. And peace, on the other hand, is filled with materialism, artistic decline, effeminacy, selfishness, immorality, stagnation, cowardice, boredom, sensuality, utter emptiness. Uh, my, my favorite is bovine content and death. Uh, and, and I looked to see if anybody was saying that after World War I. Finding that before World War I is extremely easy. Just page through, you know, the, the equivalent of foreign affairs, and you'll find an uh, article called God's Purpose by War, written by a theologian. Uh, after the war, you can't, it's almost impossible to find it at all. Um, and that the, the, the general hostility to the international war was, I think, uh, embellished very much, obviously, by World War II. Um, and I can go into that if you want why. Uh, but anyway, uh, in, after the war, is basically the the idea was consensual worldwide, uh, substantially. Um, uh, And Europe now has now been at peace, from freedom from substantial international war for the longest period of time since the word was invented. The the word meaning Europe was invented. And that's the most, and it used to be the most warlike of continents. So this is really an astounding change. Then gradually what's happened over the over this uh, uh, the period since 1945 is international war just generally not only international war among developed states but international war pretty much everywhere has really been very much in decline. So in this century, and we're 20 years into it, 21 years now, um, the, uh, uh, the 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 only inter- international wars as commonly defined are those uh, between uh, are the two wars that the United States started. After uh, 9/11, the one against Afghanistan and the one against uh, Iraq, uh, and there haven't been others. There, there's, it's not that everybody is really nice and sweet. They do things like they lob cyber balloons, they snatch little bits of territory, they poach fish, uh, they in, intervene in other people's civil wars. So there's war-like things going on. But uh, basically, my argument is they've pretty much given up the idea of using war as a method international war to solve their problems. Um, and, uh, and so we're in a, in a period of uh, that where that seems to prevail. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, how you define uh, war actually matters for these things. So Russia, we're, as we're talking, Russia and the Ukraine um, are having some problems. <clears throat> and I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, how we define, we, we, when we define war, it's often, you know, they have to meet some uh, body count threshold. Uh, but, you know, e- but even if, even if you want to count that as a war, it's still, you're right, it's very low. They're, they're the exception and they're, they're not as bloody as they used to be. I mean, that is absolute. Well, well let me just add on that. Obama once said, uh, we're saying we got to do something about Ukraine, uh, the, the Crimea being taken over by Russia in 1914, 2014. Um, and he said, um, uh, anybody that wants to go to war to stop this, stand up, stand up in Washington and let me know right now. And the silence, of course, was deafening. The right. Crimea thing, the kind of thing that people used to fight wars over. In this case, they didn't. It, it wasn't a war in the sense of a lot of people being killed, of course. Uh, it was essentially bloodless. So by normal standards of warfare, it wasn't a war. It was a, uh, you know, subversion or something, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's right. And uh, yeah, I mean, so g- going back to the World War I thing, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, yeah, why that was sort of a threshold, right? Um, do you have theories? Because you would think, uh, you know, I, I would just guess, I mean, this is, it's hard to prove uh, Stephen Pinker's wonderful book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, you know, I read it and, and there's, he really believes that that moral values and basically uh, humanitarian concerns really changed over time. Um, 
And he doesn't really have, you know, one kind of explanation, the kind of things that, you know, academics like to latch on, latch on to. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think that he thinks, and I, I think I agree with this, it can't be unrelated to the technology. The fact that you now have uh, videos, the fact that, you know, even uh, medical technology where people can survive more uh, with more horrific um uh, with more horrific injuries, some some things are just you know some things are just technolo- uh, technologically uh, they're rendered op- obsolete. So knighthood, you know, they would fight with swords and on horseback, and that was rendered basically obsolete by uh, by uh, uh, firearms, right? And you can't have a culture <laughs> of, of war being this great thing and everyone doing it in a world of nuclear weapons. So that comes a little later, obviously, than after World War One. Uh, but how much right. do you think technology is driving these things? I don't. I don't think technology is driving them much at all. Uh, the 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 anti-war movement that started about 1898 or 1889 uh, was basically saying it's barbaric, it's disgusting, uh, it's immoral, uh, it's futile from an economic standpoint. Uh, and then uh, and there were this gadfly movement, and then the, the ideas, the, the people writing this stuff, uh, basically just thought they were sort of you know. Uh, serenading in in the in the um, in the graveyard, but it it caught on. It was an idea whose time had come, and the comparison might be with slavery. You know, at one point people started jumping up and down saying we shouldn't do slavery anymore, and people said you're crazy. Everybody's been doing slavery every place in the whole world. You know, God has it in the Bible and everything, uh, and and they said no, we just don't want to do slavery anymore. And in a hundred years, it went away, even though it was quite profitable. Uh, particularly the, the Atlantic slave trade was uh, was uh, big business, um, and so what you do is you get ideas that simply. Uh, I disagree with Steve on this because he wants to. He, he doesn't. He's uncomfortable with the idea that war went away because people became less warlike. <laughs> and my opinion is that's what they did. Uh, they did, and and that's why this this content analysis, looking at how many people were saying how wonderful war was before World War One, and how nobody was saying it afterwards. Now, let me give you another example. It would be uh, Germany and and and, uh, and uh, France. Now, there's a whole lot of people in Germany that are really smart. There's a whole lot of people in France that are really smart. And for centuries, they've been using their brilliance to get into stupid wars with each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Forty-five, as far as I know, there's not been a single German, a single person in France who said, "Let's renew the venerable tra- tradition." Uh, and if you'd got on a soapbox and said that, they'd probably cart you off to the loony bin. They wouldn't even know how to contradict you. You, you know, they'd say they, they wouldn't come up with, you know, well, the cost will outweigh the benefits and so forth. Yeah. They just say this is the crazy thing I've ever heard. So that's a big change. And a lot of historians have noticed that um, and, and political science over the time. And I'm, I'm, you know, that's central to my story. The people simply put it away. The other example is dueling. Dueling, you, you know, is fable all over the place. Sure. But by the end, century, it became obsolete. Uh, people were laughed at if they if they dueled. Uh, and it hasn't happened. And you still have young men of that same dueling class uh, who get mad as anything, and they still have their testosterone is too high, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't ever even consider the idea of challenging the other guy to a duel. Um, and that's been sort of a permanent change. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I agree with you that you can't. So, I mean, I guess we should, you know, there's, there's an entire spectrum of how much you think technology matters and how much you think ideas are sort of uh, causal forces. So, in our, our field of international relations, <laughs> a guy named Kenneth Waltz, uh, who will say that uh, war stopped because of nuclear weapons. So he, he's, he's, he's looking beyond World War One and World War Two. And so that's, I think, like a pure materialistic explanation. I think that that's the kind of explanation that people in international relations are most comfortable with, uh, something like that, yes. something about the weapons, because I, I think that if, otherwise international relations is not a field, right? <laughs> to be a scientific field, you need explanations beyond people just decided this was stupid. And once they didn't think it was stupid, and now they think it was stupid, right? If that's the explanation, then, you know, what's the, what's the field? Well, well, it's sort of like, it's sort of saying it went out of style. Yeah. They, they, yeah, you yeah. got to have some sort of exogenous, you know, variable or something, some sort of something else that caused it. And it seems to me that, that that's not the case. So it is very subversive. I agree. Um, in terms of nuclear weapons, by the way, it's not, you know, I did a whole book about 10 years ago called Atomic Obsession. I've been writing about this for my whole career, basically. Nuclear weapons don't seem to have made much difference um, since 1945. 
Um, there's tons of evidence coming out of the Soviet archives after they're opened up after the fall of the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it's clear that they never in a million years had any interest in getting into war. It could look anything like World War II with or without nuclear weapons. Um, they were planning to defend themselves if they were attacked, but they never even had plans to take over Western Europe, even in the contingency plans. Yeah, right. And, uh, and the, uh, yeah, so uh, to, to go finish my thoughts. So, yeah, Waltz is one of the spectrum where ideas don't matter at all. Uh, I think Pinker, I think you're, as the way you're presenting him, I think you're right on this, is sort of a moderate where he thinks technology and stuff matters, but also thinks ideas matter too. And I see that you're sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum from Waltz where you're saying, you know, we just have to, we just have to look at the ideas, right? And I think, and I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm closer to Pinker. I think I'm. I think I'm in. Uh, well, I'm, I'd, I'd like Steve a lot. You know that his stuff. And just disagree on that particular point. One of the things that happened is it's clear. You know, by looking at what people were saying, and I'm not talking about Prussian militarists necessarily, but poets, art critics, right, philosophers, historians, that war was the bee's knees before World War II, before World War One. They said it all the time, and in four years, that idea vanished. So it's hard to see that as being a technological change. Um, World War II, World War I is incredibly destructive. There have been huge numbers of wars in the past have been far more destructive. I mean, as I mentioned initially, uh, Troy was violent, was, was, was annihilated uh, in, in the war with the Greeks, uh, uh, you know, uh, with about a thousand years BC. So, uh, and, uh, and in the 30 years war uh, in Europe, it was, it was generally assumed until the 1930s that about 80 or 90 percent of all Germans were killed in that war in that, or series of wars. It turned out that number was high. But the point is, they believed that, that it was there was 80 or 90 percent died. And no one said, let's not. That's really dumb. Let's not do that anymore. So the change of opinion is very brief. Uh, it's hard to see it by any other any other. Uh, um, do you think, do you think uh, do you, do you think we're just smarter? Are you familiar with the Flynn effect? The what? The Flynn effect? Uh, so, no, missed okay. the word. Huh? Uh, so in in the uh, uh, so in the research on uh, intelligence testing, uh, basically. Oh the, yes. And the uh, you know the idea is that over the last uh, I think uh, uh, half century to a century, there's just been a massive increase on how people score on intelligence tests. Now, you know, yeah. what's the cause of that? Are they really getting smarter? And one theory is they're just, you know, they're just better nourished or they have more stimulation. And so just yeah, like but that, taller, that, that, that's uh, why that's why the four year thing makes is a, is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, right, they, but, but, they didn't get they didn't get all that much smarter in four years. <laughs> right, no, 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 but 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 if you combine it, so if you compare it to the Thirty Years' War, right, where people were a lot mm -hmm. shorter and a lot dumber, well, maybe they weren't able to learn that lesson after that. You needed the cataclysm, right, combined with people being a little bit smarter to maybe to maybe uh, create that kind of reaction. Well, I, well it may be there. They, 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 they were receptive to the idea, but it's very hard to see it anywhere before World War One. Um, they, you, you, you did have this peace movement. It did publish a couple of bestsellers. Uh, it did attract the attention of some major figures, capitalists like um, Andrew Carnegie and, um, and uh, Alfred Nobel. But it was very much a gadfly movement. It was ridiculed uh, as being effeminate in particular. You know, it's, a, it, it's an elderly sewing bee for old aunts of both sexes. Uh, as, as one German writer put it. Um, so it, it basically, and then you can find people after World War I, uh, such as uh, prominent diplomats in Britain saying, I used to think war was really great. Now I think it has to be abolished. Um, and that's, it, it, they didn't get, you know, they were smart before World War I and they were no, no less smart after it. Yeah, I, I think that I think that makes sense because even if the even if the masses sort of didn't have enough nutrition or for whatever reason weren't intelligent, you're there are the, at least very intelligent people as far as philosophers and leaders and and you know they were probably as smart as at least the smartest leaders today. And you're right, they <laughs> very few of them thought war was stupid. They saw it that way. So uh, yeah, I mean, so I, somebody listening to this might say, okay, you know, you talk about World War One, and then there was this idea change in World War One. But one person who did speak positively about 
war after uh, after 1918 and 1919 was Adolf Hitler. And so I think the question people want to say is, does, does the rise of Hitler refute uh, refute your arguments? Is, is, is pacifism sort of a nice luxury to have, just as long as there are there aren't other Hitler, there's not a Hitler on the horizon? Yeah, I've got about 20 historians who basically say if Hitler had been run over by a train or a bus, or he was in a very bad automobile accident in 1930, World War II never would have taken place. The Japanese still believed in the old militarism stuff, uh, but the, in Europe, uh, people like John Keegan, the military historian, said only one European wanted war, and it was Adolf Hitler. Um, he had a somewhat limited idea of what he wanted to do because he thought he could do things quick and easy, with uh, quick and brutal, uh, with the things like Blitzkrieg. Um, but there was no, there was, there's no, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there's two major studies, one by Ian, Ian Kershaw, about public opinion in Germany. And they, they both say there is clear that there was no drive for war among the German people. They had a lot of resentments about, you know, the Versailles Treaty and so forth. And those are gradually being relaxed leading up to Munich in 1938. So, um, uh, in that and a couple of other books, I've extensively looked at it. And as far as I can see, um, it's, uh, if Hitler was, you know, a, a unique and obviously tra tragic and disastrous and monstrous um, aberration. By the way, and Hitler knew it. Uh, and I didn't know he was a monster, but he, he knew it. Yeah. Well, he probably knew he may be even known as a monster. I'm not sure. Um, but um, in all the, I've, I've put online, in fact, uh, I've gone through all his speeches in the 1930s after he became chancellor, every, every foreign policy speech. And every foreign policy speech, he said how much he hated war. Right. Yeah. And he gives, he even says, he uses his racism, which is amazing. He says, look, I'm a racist. Read my stuff. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you are, you definitely are. That <laughs> one, right? You're not lying about that one. I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, if I'm a racist, so I want to have all the blonde, blue eyed, blue -eyed uh, Germans in one place. Why would I take over, you know, someplace yucky like Poland? It's got a bunch of Slavs. You know what I think of Slavs? Uh, they're, 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 they're basically at best as slaves. You know, why would I, why do why would I lose some of the, the, the greatest manhood of, of Germany to take over a disgusting place like, uh, they, like, uh, um, Poland? Uh, that was the big lie, of course. Uh, but he did that, he said, because of necessity, both internationally and because of the German people. He lied about his, uh, uh, interest in going to war, particularly the, the, you know, the expansion to the East. Some of that is in Mein Kampf, but it didn't come up later. Yeah, yeah. When you get when you read uh, Mein Kampf and then you compare Hitler's speeches as a politician, you know you do see Mein Kampf is sort of more consistent. And you know, yeah, there's private, uh, uh, you know, there's private discussions where he talks about basically needing a war. And I think there was after was after the Anschluss, right? He he wanted a, another war, uh, and I think it was a. Uh, the uh, I think the che the checks folded too easily, and he was actually upset about that. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Right, the, M Munich was not a matter of appeasement. Uh, he was uh, unappeasable, as several historians who looked at it uh, have said. Yeah. Uh, right, he was he was he was um, um, he, he was very much the master of the Third Reich. Um, he seemed to be doing everything right for about ten years. He was very lucky in a lot of ways. Um, he had seemed to at least have revived the economy of Germany. So when, when there's the Anschluss in, in Austria wanted to join, they basically were joining what they thought would be, uh, um, uh, you know, be from an economic standpoint, really very desirable. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but there was no one, else, I keep looking for someone else saying that, like in the, in the general staff or among his, um, uh, allies or his, 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 uh, you know, coterie. Of, of top Nazis, Gehring and Goebbels and, uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and Heydrich and so forth. And basically you can't see it. There's nobody else that had that, that really wanted to drive to the East, was willing to risk major war to do so and had the capacity to bring it off. All the generals were political, uh, midgets. And, um, the, the guys around him, Goebbels, et cetera, were basically zeros compared to the one. In fact, there's a joke. A German joke at the time. That one of the uh, Rudolf Hess defected, and he flew one of the top leaders of the Nazi Party, and he flew to England and tried to convince England to get out of the war and let Hitler 
and Germany do what they wanted and hit, and they basically locked them up in the loony bin. Um, and the joke in, in Germany was, well, now the thousand year Reich is only a hundred year Reich because we've lost one of the zeros. In other words, the, the third yeah. Reich was one, namely Hitler, and then a bunch of zeros. Uh, so it's an, an as astounding and ghastly, of course, achievement, but I think it, it stands very much with Hitler. Yeah. And do you think, uh, would you classify sort of America, the mistakes of American foreign policy? Because you have a lot to say, not just about history, but uh, sort of American foreign policy uh, since the uh, since the end of World War II. Is, is our mistake, uh, to put it simply, that we think everyone is everyone is Hitler, when really Hitler was just a really unique figure? Yes, I think it's a big mistake to see this as uh, a continuation of World War I, for example, a systemic war or anything. It was a massive aberration. And one of the reasons Hitler was successful was nobody in Europe could think that he could possibly want to do something that resembled World War I again. Yeah, right. Anybody could want to do that. So when he gave him these reassuring speeches about, you know, I was in the trenches, I was gassed. Everybody in the Nazi party fought in that war. And we all, you know, a lot of them died and a lot of them were wounded and so forth. We don't want to do that again. They believed him. Um, it was, it was, of course, the big lie. Yeah, and so yeah, so after World War II, you know, the U.S. goes to Europe, and it stays there. And the justification for that is basically they got to defend Europe for because the Soviet Union might basically, uh, you know, just go west and take over, you know, take over Western Europe. And you've written about, you wrote that about in your book. So can you tell like that idea where it comes from and why we know it's not true? As I mentioned, there's, there's no, there were no plans to attack in the West. Um, and so the idea that we had, had to have NATO and nuclear weapons to deter the Soviet Union is just nonsense, as far as I can see. It was no, they're, they're essentially irrelevant. As I said in an article in 1988, by the way, um, and I still, still believe that, um, maybe a few people are starting to agree. Um, and uh, the Soviets basically uh, controlled after World War II a huge area that even Hitler would have been happy with, except for the dismemberment of Germany. This, this massive empire, they were occupying it, of course, and running it in Eastern Europe. And they also subscribed to, they did subscribe to an aggressive ideology, and that was that they were going to increase uh, and expand communism, but it'd be done through class warfare, uh, civil warfare and subversion. So they were very happy to try to help out the Communist Party in France and Italy and so forth. But that's not war. So they, they were right that they were basically out to destroy democracy and particularly destroy capitalism. The Soviets said that only a billion times in you know, every pamphlet, book, bumper sticker uh, talked about that. And they really believed it. So there's an ideological battle, but it, they, at no time did they really see uh, aggressive warfare, particularly anything that looked like World War I or II, uh, being sensible. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And <clears throat> one of the people who realized this was uh, was Dwight Eisenhower. And I, I mentioned in the book uh, from his memoirs, uh, right after World War II, he flew to see uh, if the World War II in, in Europe ending in, in May 1945. He flew to Moscow to talk to Stalin uh, as head of the Allied Forces, commander in chief. Uh, and they had discussions and so forth. And then he flew back. And as he was flying back to Berlin, I imagine, uh, the plane was flying low enough and there were not enough clouds. So he could see down to the ground. And he said, everything was destroyed from Moscow to the border. And then, you know, through Poland and Germany as well. Everything was destroyed. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to do that again. And of course, they said it themselves all the time. You know, Khrushchev talking about how he lost his son in the war and so forth. Um, and he was one of the few people, I think, who really saw that, though he was never really willing to say it in public. Instead, he attacked the, the military industrial complex, uh, blaming it for manipulating politics. But he didn't go after their, their chief in motivating argument, which was that the Ruskies are, are going to come over the full of pass and we've got to build up military stuff to, to prevent that, uh, which he didn't believe was true. But he didn't really attack the argument. Uh, he didn't really say, no, they're not going to start a war. Instead, he said, you know, we got to deal with this, this lobby that's working with that premise so successfully. Yeah. And so why do you think that the United States after World War II couldn't see this? Because there was 
uh, the, the, you know, if you look at Stalin's time in, in uh, power, there there wasn't any anything to suggest that he was reckless on the international uh, in, on the international plane in the way Hitler was. So there was no real reason to think that they would go into West Germany, much less you know uh, anywhere else in Europe. Uh, so so why why do you think the U.S. got that wrong after World War II? Well, I think the, the the Korean War was the most important event of the Cold War, in my opinion. Um, there were two hypotheses about that. One, 100% of the people bought, namely, this is a uh, diversionary tactic in a far corner of the earth to divert the United States because the, the, this shows that the Soviet Union will use uh, standard, standard warfare to advance. The other was that this was a limited probe in a corner of the earth at that time that no one even knew what it was. Um, half the people call it chosen rather than Korea, in fact. Um, it was one of the poorest areas in the world. And there was it was a kind of a overripe apple that could be plucked by the North Koreans. And that, and that it basically is what it was, the second hypothesis. Um, now, both hypotheses in 1950 or so were plausible. Both they had evidence to support them. But no one bought the second one. Instead, what they thought was they they just went berserk on the first hypothesis that this was a uh, situation in which Russia had showed and the Soviet Union had showed it would use direct warfare to advance the cause. So it's very traumatic um, and um, and widely accepted. And so therefore, the reaction was we've got to be able. They, at that time, they'd already formed NATO. But uh, with the Korean War, NATO became a much more serious military alliance, one, in my opinion, that was completely unnecessary. But they did, if you subscribe to their theory that Russia showed it was really reckless and willing to go to risk World War II, World War III, uh, even a conventional World War III, then it was plausible. It was just, they, they would, but the evidence overwhelmingly, it seems to me, suggests that that was not true. Yeah, and the uh, historical work has basically showed it wasn't Stalin who was pushing for uh, Korean War. It was really by the it was really being pushed by the actor on the ground, Kim Il Sung, and sort yes. of had to be brought. And, and that was perfectly plausible. They didn't have enough evidence to know that for sure. When I remember when Khrushchev's memoirs came out after he, he was ousted in 1964, and he, he dictated his memoirs, and he talked about the Korean War and he explained it just basically the way I have. And wait, now a document, there's lots of documents and so forth, uh, 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 verifying it, that Stalin was actually quite reluctant. And uh, that Kim Il-sung um, said um, that, uh, you know, we can knock over North, South Korea in, in, an, in, a, in an island with an, in an augenblick, you know, uh, I, 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 I blink, uh, blink. And uh, he reluctantly agreed, but he also was very carefully withdrew Russia from the peninsula, by and large, though he's willing to supply North Korea. And he said, if you get into big trouble, don't look at us. Um, right. and, and so, and then, and that, that was very plausible when that came out. And as they say, it's been reified big time when we've got the documents from the, the crucial meetings at that time. Yeah. And okay. So in 1950, I think, I think you're right there. You know, it's a mistake that uh, a reasonable actor can make. Uh, but that's, you know, that's 1950. By the time you get to Vietnam, uh, you know, I, I think it's clearer that there is no uh, Soviet plan for invading Western Europe, starting to conquer countries by force. <clears throat> and so why do, why do we keep making this same mistake? And then you get to, I mean, and then you move even forward in time. And then we, the Soviet Union collapses, it goes away, almost like the, you know, the, <laughs> the perfect test for whether the U.S. is able to take in new information. And the troops mostly stay where they are. They come down a little bit from Germany, but basically they stay where they are and they start expanding east. And it's, uh, you know, in, in 90s, I didn't think they even talked about Russia aggression much. But now we talk about, now we talk about Russian aggression the last uh, 10, 15 years in the Putin era. Um, so the mistake, the mistake of overestimating the um, ambition of um, your potential adversaries, that seems to have made sense in the early 1950s. But, the, but it's, it's been 75 years almost of that mistake now. So what do you th what do you how would you explain that? Yeah, the, well, the, there, was, there was two things about the Soviet Union. One was wrong, namely that they were out to start World War III or be reckless enough possibly to risk it big time. But the other one was true. Basically, there was the containment policy, which is to keep them from advancing. 
Uh, in other words, not by military means, but by subversion, by supporting civil wars, by encouraging class warfare, which is very much in their theory and their doctrine. And so the idea of containment was to basically keep them from advancing, but they weren't advancing very fast. Uh, after the after the fall of China in 1949, there was you know they picked up North Vietnam, and they picked up Cuba in 1959 and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the next step seems to have been Vietnam. Uh, where North Korea, where North Vietnam was essentially under uh, creating and and, and uh, um, exacerbating a civil war in, in South Vietnam, and the United States felt it had to stop them there, uh, so it got into that war. Um, what and it, it was a major tragedy. If they hadn't gone in, maybe the communists would have taken over Vietnam in 1964 or 65. Instead, they took it over, of course, in 1975. Uh, and it's not, you know, and meanwhile, but well over a million people were killed. So it's, it's a really uh, great tragedy. Uh, then what happened was that there were a whole bunch of countries that fell into the Soviet orbit. There's not only the three countries, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam in, South, in Southeast Asia, but also about three of them in Africa, Nicaragua, perhaps, uh, Grenada, uh, South Yemen, and, and Afghanistan. And they all looked toward the Soviet Union for maternal warmth and sustenance. And they, what they argued, and, and, the, and the, at first, the Soviet Union, the, the theorists were really gung-ho about this. The correlation of forces is turning on our side. Country after country is falling into our camp. But each of these countries then turned into economic and political and often military basket cases and looked to the Soviet Union for warmth and sustenance. And uh, it, felt, it came to conclude, particularly after it intervened in Afghanistan, that it would have been better off contained. At any rate, as you mentioned earlier, the, the, the contradictions were more within the Soviet system and it basically collapsed of its own weight, not because of containment, um, and massively overspending militarily, uh, uh, taking on dependencies in Eastern Europe, which are very expensive, bailing out Cuba, bailing out uh, Vietnam, having troubles with the, with the his former Chinese ally, um, and it, it basically fell apart from, uh, and, and a lot of irrationalities, of course, in the economy as well. Uh, and uh, it fell apart basically of its own weight uh, in 1989 and then the collapse of the Soviet Union itself in 1991. Yeah. And so, but why do you think uh, the U.S. was so... You're right. I mean, you're right. I think you're right on the collapse of the Soviet Union. And basically, they realized at some point that this this wasn't working. The economic system was just a best case, and nobody wanted that economic system because they could see the results. At the end, this even the even the leaders of the Soviet Union didn't want it, and that's why uh, they switched to something else. Uh, but uh, focusing on the U.S., so the U.S. stayed in Europe after the Soviet Union was gone, and that was the original reason for being there. So what do you, well, what's your theory of what the U.S. was doing, uh, has, has been doing uh, since the 1990s, since it's been expanding NATO? Okay, uh, after the Cold War, um, uh, or at the very end of the, after the Cold War and before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the uh, Saddam Hussein took over Kuwait and the United States led a coalition to push him out. And it was a very easy task because the Iraqis didn't have anything in the way of morale, leadership strategy, tactics, um, or leadership. Um, and so um, they, they basically walked over it. And the Soviet Union under Gorbachev was basically supportive of that. Um, so, and then, and then you have this, this world order that comes with it after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union itself in 1991. Um, the, and what seems to be guiding things, it's hard to explain. That, uh, and, uh, it, it's basically sort of inertia uh, the United States has been uh, interested in trying to police the world here and there. But, uh, you know, I use the phrase repeatedly, <laughs> I'm afraid, in the book. It was vast proclamation and half vast execution. So um, after the Gulf War, they tried to get involved in policing a situation in Somalia. Uh, 21 of its soldiers, American soldiers, were killed in a, in a firefight, and the United States withdrew. The next year, there's a genocide in Rwanda in 1994, and the United States didn't get in at all. Uh, it did get concerned about the, uh, the uh, situation in Yugoslavia, a bunch of uh, civil wars basically going on in Yugoslavia as it broke up in the early 1990s. But the United States didn't really intervene 
uh, with troops or anything, did some bombing, but that's about it. And, and uh, didn't send troops there until the war was essentially over in 1995. Uh, later on, it also policed things uh, with, along with NATO as Kosovo tried to and successfully did secede from Serbia. But the United States didn't get any closer to that than, you know, 40,000 feet, just did some bombing. Um, so there was sort of an exertion. People talk about this as a liberal world order, the United States trying to police the world. But if so, it was pretty li- limited. Uh, overall, the thing that did change uh, was the uh, is uh, 9/11, which I think is the most important event of the post Cold War period, as Korea was the most important event of the of the, of the Cold War, uh, and that set people's teeth very much on edge and impelled the United States into its two basically disastrous wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, with some other tinkering as in intervening in the Syrian civil war and also intervening, uh, urged on by the British and French in Libya. So there has, essentially after, and I think now we're in a position, basically what I call the Iraq syndrome. After Vietnam, there was a thing called the Iraq, the Vietnam syndrome saying, let's not do that again. And the United States basically didn't do it. Didn't do it. It still was prosecuting the Cold War, but it didn't get into uh, those kinds of wars. Um, and then I think now what's happening is after 9-11 and after disasters of these forever wars in those two countries, uh, the general opinion is let's not do that again. So there's lots of possibilities like bombing North Korea or doing something about really serious militarily about Iran, and it doesn't fly very well. And I think that's the situation we're in now. Yeah, it's sort of the Vietnam syndrome. You know, there was a Vietnam syndrome and that we weren't going to fight any big land wars. And then 9-11 changed that. And it seems like we just learned the exact same lesson again, and now we're back. So it's like, it was like the Vietnam syndrome has just been uh, half a century of straight, no no land wars interrupted for a good you know, 10, 10 to 20 years, <clears throat> uh, which was uh, set off by 9-11 with this crazy idea that we had to you know, have these major military sacrifices in order to head off the problem of terrorism. Uh, right. But it looks like the Vietnam syndrome is back, and maybe we call it the Iraq syndrome. <laughs> you know, I think you're right. I think we've learned. Yeah, I've happened. written a lot about terrorism and uh, the massive, massive, massive exaggeration. In fact, one of the themes of the book is a threat exaggeration. How much the United States has, has exaggerated the threats that are out there, and I think it's still doing it. Yeah, you had a, uh, one of your books that was called Terror, Security, and Money. Uh, so you wrote that with Mark Stewart. And you talk about, you know, every every policy has to have a cost-benefit justification. Well, it doesn't have to. We do things all the time that don't have cost-benefit uh, uh, calculations, but they should in theory. Um, you don't just say, well, we're going to save one life, so we're going to bankrupt the country. Uh, there's there's costs and benefits to, to everything. So can you talk about what, what you found when you applied actual cost-benefit analysis to what the U.S. has been doing on terrorism over the last 20 years? Yeah, I've done that. I did basically three books, four, four books. I also did think, uh, Atomic Obsession, which basically does that, too, in terms of deals with will, will terrorists get nuclear weapons and so forth, arguing that they won't. And, of course, so far I've been right. Um, yeah, the, the uh, uh, basically what is, what is proved to be the case is that Al Qaeda is rather similar to Lee Harvey Os- Oswald, the guy who killed John Kennedy. Yeah. Name, name, yeah. Name, a very a trivial entity that got horribly lucky once. Um, and uh, that was the, it, it, there's a comparison between after 9 11. And after the invasion, after the invasion of South Korea by North Korea, that everybody in the Korean case, uh, you know, universally thought this was the start of, you know, we're moving on toward World War III, which was not true, obviously. And after 9-11, it was a huge, everybody in the intelligence uh, was convinced there are going to be more 9-11s, big ones, big attacks on the United States. Uh, and uh, therefore, we had to do something about it. Uh, and uh, the two wars were the 9-11 wars. Ne- neither of those wars, I think, would have taken place without 9-11. Um, and they proved to be disasters and colossal disasters in the sense that the number of people who died in Iraq and in Afghanistan is in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of people have died because of the American policy. And uh, American policy, military policy, 
has essentially created entities who are worse than what the Taliban was running or Saddam Hussein was running right. before that. And that's really an amazing statement because those are really contemptible regimes. So, <coughs> so the United States has managed to make things worse in those two entities. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's obviously, yeah, that's obviously right. I mean, with the, you know, Al-Qaeda was the, was the reason that we had to go into uh, the Middle East and in a really big way after 9-11. And we thought our, our, our imagination was sort of cons- constrained because we thought Al-Qaeda was the worst thing we could imagine. The Syrian civil war com- uh, comes along, and, you know, the Arab Spring more generally, and Al-Qaeda is pretty much the moderate opposition there. <laughs> and see, because you have ISIS that's taking over part that took over parts of Syria and Iraq, um, and so yeah, I mean this stuff, this stuff, this stuff clearly. I mean, first of all, Al Qaeda itself uh, was basically holed up in the most remote region of the world, right, in, in uh, southern Afghanistan, um, and now you know today, and basically where it succeeds, and this is the problem with the, the with the sort of the American view. It, it, it was a view that. Intentions, because they're bad people, Al Qaeda, they're going to get stronger. They're going to, you know, t- you know, uh, uh, kill people or take over the country. But it wasn't really about their. Uh, it wasn't really about their ideolo- ideology necessarily, as much as it was they uh, they uh, feed on chaos. So basically, in countries where the governments have been stable, uh, there hasn't been much Al Qaeda, or there hasn't been much terrorism. Uh, and then the countries which are destabilized, our, our view was we destabilized them because we're going to have democracy in the in the end. Uh, so we need to, you know, we need to have a civil war or two first. Um, and it's in those countries that you get Al Qaeda, then eventually worse than Al Qaeda, you get you get ISIS. Uh, so it's it's an absolutely insane policy. Um, yeah, and and, wild, and wildly destructive as well. The war in Iraq, <coughs> the the military didn't even realize even think about the possibility that once they got into Iraq, that Iran and Syria, members of the axis of evil, were going to support opposition. And of course they did. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And then it's not even, I mean, I think that with the last administration, I think some people said this explicitly, that Iran was actually um, worse than all kinds. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people on the American right say that. And yeah. it's obviously not true if you're just worried about threats to the United States. Now, if you're worried about threats to other regional actors, I could see why you would possibly think that, right? Um, if Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel are sort of your main concerns, I think it had to a uh, very militant at your own policy. It's at least in the realm of sanity. I mean, it sort of makes sense. Uh, while if you're worried about the you know, US interests, it, it completely doesn't. Uh, is, is that your view on the Iranian issue too? Yeah. <clears throat> Iran is basically a um... You know, the, the, the regime in Iran has been voted out of office several times, effectively, um, but it still exists. <clears throat> and I think basically, if you just leave it alone, it's going to largely self-destruct the way the Soviet Union did. I have a subtitle in the book about the case for complacency. And I think they, that case is well made with respect to particularly uh, Iran. Iran. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the country potentially collapsing. I think there was a uh, uh, ideological. I mean, there was an ideological loss of faith at the top of the Soviet regime. So if you read, uh, uh, yeah, Kotkin has a great Stephen Kotkin has a great book on the end of the Soviet Union, and he just talks about basically it, it was just a top down choice thing. So I, I don't know if the Iranian regime is going to make a similar uh, decision. And the little polling I've seen on Iran. Is you know in the Western press we hear well they're all you know pro American and they want a new government. Uh, the, the the polling of public opinion in Iran is much more um, is much more nuanced as far as I've seen. For example, that people don't re- don't by and large reject a large role of for Islam uh, in the government. So I, I don't know if Iran will. I don't, I don't know why. Yeah, but there's been, there's been a lot of big protests about the you know expansion and, and messing around in the rest of the Middle East when the economy of Iran itself is foundering. So, yeah. So, I mean, just to switch topics, I mean, I th- another one of your works I really liked, and this is, gen- you know, general beyond the American uh, situation, is there was a, uh, a a paper you wrote called The Banality of uh, Ethnic War. Was, it, was, that, was that what it was called? Yes. Yeah. 
the banality, banality of ethnic war and said an international security. Uh, it's available. For, it's not paywall, so people can Google it and they can find it online. Uh, can you tell? You looked at uh, the former Yugoslavia, the 1990s, and Rwanda, two places where um, the general narrative was that there was these uh, deep-seated ethnic conflicts and they spilled over. And that's why we saw mass killing and why we saw uh, war in the case of Yugoslavia. Uh, can you talk about the paper? What what people generally, what's the popular perception of those conflicts and why do you argue that it's wrong? Yeah, the, the original idea, as you mentioned, is sort of ethnic warfare, sort of Hobbesian, uh, man against man and so forth, neighbor against neighbor. And the more I looked into those wars, I realized that Hobbes basically had it wrong. Uh, it was mostly being carried out by in an anarchic situation by thugs, including the most literal thugs, namely people who are released from jail to go to 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 to, uh, to commit the genocide in one case, and to uh, to uh, uh, generate ethnic cleansing of of Muslims uh, in the other, and. Uh, uh, as other people found, it is a very small number of people doing it. Uh, one town in in uh, Bosnia, uh, one one town in uh, in uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, was controlled by a band of thugs of about fifteen people, who were quite murderous, um, but uh, it, they basically intimidated the whole town. Um, so what I found basically was that it was um, it was it was not everybody against everybody. It was basically a situation which politicians in particular were able to unleash, direct, and reward uh, a small numbers of people who were basically able to wreak considerable havoc. Uh, thugs, basically. And as I say, literal thugs in the sense, they released them from jail. Partly they did that because they couldn't get any, anybody else to fight. In the case of, in the case of Yugoslavia, uh, they, supposedly the fighting was initially between Croats and Serbs. The Serbs went out and tried to recruit people to fight the evil Croats, and they, nobody showed up, or they deserted. Um, they actually one wonderful story. Um, and by the way, I wrote this, also developed this into a book and called The Remnants of War. It came out in 2004. Um, uh, one general was so fed up with his recruits that he screamed at them, say, anybody that doesn't want to fight for greater Serbia uh, throw down your weapons, take off your uniforms, and go away. And everybody did. Um, then he said, and this is about the, the general as well saying, they eventually found some weapons and they used it to shell his headquarters. <laughs> yeah. Exactly the average Serb rising up to fight ancient enemies. And that's basically shown uh, by the situation since 1995 when the war came to an end. As far as I'm able to see, there has not been a single case of ethnic uh, murder <coughs> in the former Yugoslavia since the, since the war came to an end. In other words, it wasn't they, they, everybody hating everybody else, but they had to get stabilized and get rid of the thugs. Uh, most, most of them were not able to fight very much. Uh, they're very good at killing civilians, but they were not uh, impressed by, um, by uh, uh, you know, disciplined troops. Uh, criminals, uh, slogan after all, is not, Semper Fidelius, but take the money and run. And that's what they mostly did. Yeah, the, uh, you know, that's, yeah, I think there there's, you know, a very deep <coughs> question about how we understand, um, how we understand sort of when we see civil war, and that's the most common kind of war these days, or violence within a state and mass killing. You're right. There's a tendency to treat it as like whatever's happening in a country. It was like uh, the Iraq uh, in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion of Iraq too. It's just aggregate of hatred. So if Serbs hate, you know, if Serbs and um, uh, uh, Kosovars are killing each other in in large numbers, um, or one side is slaughtering another, and then they're fighting Croats, it just tells you something. You can infer how much Serbs hate the other ethnicities in their in the former Yugoslavia, right? And so you infer from Iraq the fact that after the U.S. invaded, uh, there was these a uh, lot of killings between Sunni and Shia, and you go, well, there must have been a, you know, it's just it's a thousand plus year history of these uh, these Middle Eastern tribes hating each other. And what you're saying is that's the wrong way to understand it. It's more that there are situations where um, 
political opportunity, either order breaks down, right? Either because uh, of the for, for, uh, Yugoslavia after the uh, Yugoslavia state starts to collapse after the uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, Iraq, it was a case of the U.S. coming in and overthrowing the government. But basically, when you have it's it's the situation that makes the the conflict and whatever na the nature of the conflict takes right. It's not the it's not necessarily what's going on at the mass level. Is that, is that right? Yes, it's, it's basically the the power of the few. Um, how you can intimidate a large number of people with a very small number of guys with guns, um, and uh, that was happening. It also in R Rwanda, um, there was a genocide. It's really horrible, of course. Uh, but it was done basically by street gangs, um, drunk much of the time. And I tried to calculate what percentage of the Hutu population, which was committing the genocide against the Tutsis, uh, actually engaged in the violence. And it comes out to be maybe 2% of the male population over the age of 15. So, I mean, that's, that's still, that's a lot of people, a lot of ways, but obviously it's not everybody against everybody. Most of the Hutus were just simply holding up and, you know, they couldn't stop the Holocaust that was going on around them. Um, and uh, they may not have carried a whole lot of love for the Tutsis, uh, but they didn't participate very much overall. Yeah. And also, you know, since the genocide came to an end, it's been pretty peaceful there. Even in this case, you've got people living next door to people who were previously committing genocide, practically. Um, and uh, the amount of violence has been pretty limited. So it suggests that, you know, it's not, you got this cork in the bottle and you lift it up and then everything just flows all over the place. Yeah. And I like in your paper, you have uh, quotes from Robert Kaplan. And I like what you do in contrast, because I, what I think Kaplan and people are going to do, you know, it's a different question from the uh, actual uh, uh, the actual, you know, the, the, the political science of what actually is going on. But from the what they do is not only are they wrong, but I think that they um, they really ro sort of romanticize uh, what's happening in these countries. So when you say, well, when you're a, you're a Serb and you're killing, uh, you know, you're fighting in this ethnic conflict, what you're doing is you're part of a long, uh, you know, thousand five hundred thousand year tradition of just this uh, ethnic conflict, and you're sort of a warrior in a longer struggle. Well, you're you're telling of the uh, of the uh, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and you're telling of those conflicts. Uh, they're just they're just the the losers basically um, have an opportunity and they just go on a killing spree. And most people who have anything going for them, you know, the not criminal, the, the, the more responsible members of society want nothing to do with it. And I think that's a be much better message than war is for losers rather than war reflects some kind of deep spiritual or psychological essence of your people. Yeah. It also makes it easier to police. I mean, what you have to do is basically just police a small number of people. Uh, and since they are basically criminals in those cases, uh, in other words, they're not willing to die for anything, uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, if, if uh, somebody with uh, disciplined forces actually show up, they disappear. So, for example, in East Timor in 1999, there were rampaging mobs terrorizing the people there. The UN sent a force led by the Australians. They showed up and, they, and, the, and, they, and the mobs disappeared. They went back to ordinary criminality or they left the country. Uh, that happened also when, when in uh, Sierra Leone, when the British sent in troops. It happened in, um, in uh, Le uh, Liberia, when uh, United Nations forces led by Nigerians simply showed up in the, in the war stop. Um, so um, it, it, it makes it much simpler. And it's de definitely a Hobbesian. I mean, if, it, if you think of it, if Hobbes is being the way of doing, then you'll never get it done. At the end, at the end of uh, the Bosnian War in 1995, I've got a footnote to a couple of several people actually, two two prominent analysts, military analysts, and said that okay, it's over now, 1995, but it'll just spring up again anytime soon. You know, and this is like the clash of civilizations, as Sam Huntington was saying at the time, and that simply hasn't happened. It, it does mean they get along well. It means they, there's still hatreds. You can hate people, but that doesn't mean you're going to kill them. Um, they've, they've elected the wrong people to office <laughs> from the standpoint of the occupiers. Uh, a lot of things going wrong, a lot of criminality. Uh, but it, there's nothing like ethnic warfare or ethnic, real ethnic conflict in the sense of people killing each other since that time. 
Yeah, and reading your work, I mean, I, I, I you, somebody might uh, listening to you for a while might think that you're a pacifist who's just against all war. But I think your lesson <laughs> from uh, uh, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda is for a relatively low cost, the international community, uh, which it, it sort of did belatedly in the case of uh, the former Yugoslavia. But for uh, for a low for a relatively low cost, basically, the international community can put an end to ethnic conflict. Is that right? Yes, they can in some cases, assuming that it's being run by thugs. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Uh, but it can that. also, uh, yeah. it, it worked in Iraq in the sense that they, they, uh, the, the Iraqi military just fell apart. Right. It also worked in Afghanistan, hardly anybody defending the Taliban, except a few foreign fighters, actually. That's partly because the Taliban had uh, successfully been able to stop the export of, of uh, opium. And a lot of farmers are really mad about that. Um, when, the, when the war came, they were able to go back to their previous business. Um, but then afterwards, you have non-thugs, basically terrorists, people who are insurgents, who are willing to kill the, uh, they kill the occupiers and uh, can't really be defeated because they can get in, they can, uh, you know, find uh, uh, help um, and sanctuary in neighboring countries. In the case of Iraq, it was uh, in in Iran and in Syria. In the case of Afghanistan, it, Afghanistan, of course, it's been in in um, in Pakistan. Yeah, but it's not just that because the losses that the Islamist extremists have been willing to take in Afghanistan and Iraq have been absolutely massive, right? So it's it's right. it's, it's not just that's why I don't consider them thugs. They they consider them disciplined. Anybody who's willing to die for a cause is not a criminal. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's a, yeah, die for, that's a we don't buy for loot. But you have people who are really dedicated and willing to fight and know how to do it and are careful about it and are willing to lose their lives, and you're up against something that's really, really bad. Um, so, it, so you can be successful as the United States was in the first quarter of those two wars, but then uh, the Taliban came back, were willing to fight and die. Uh, and various insurgent groups were also willing to come back and fight and die um, because of their hatred and, and, and contempt for the American occupiers I mean, uh, on nationalism or religious grounds. Yeah. So is, is your view uh, this is, uh, that maybe in something like Yugoslavia or something like Rwanda, an international force can help when you are dealing with non-thugs but actual serious people who have ideological goals, the best we could do is just lay back. I mean, there, nothing good is going to come of fighting there. Is that your view? Yeah. Yeah. A way of looking at it is you can go in and s s try to solve the problem and maybe you'll do it. And then um, you don't know what's going to happen next. In the case of Somalia, the United States and the United Nations force did do that. There was a civil war going on. People were stealing food and people were starving to death. Um, and the United States stopped that. But then it got involved in nation building, which started to go very much awry. And uh, the, from the standpoint of the pacifying troops is, okay, they went in, they solved the problem, but then they started getting losses and then they withdrew. So the policy basically is we'll go in, we'll help you out. And if we can get a stable situation and leave, you're okay. If not, you're in big trouble. And of course, Somalia has been in very big trouble ever since that time and even before. So um, it, what, what the difference is that people are willing to spend, if you're trying to take down Hitler or the guys who bombed uh, Pearl Harbor, um, Americans and others are willing to spend a fair amount, amount number of lives, uh, but they're not willing to do it for humanitarian purposes. If you can do a humanitarian thing and it works quickly, okay, that's fine. But uh, the, the willingness to pay, expend, uh, uh, lo lose a lot of men is not there. <coughs> Yeah. So your uh, so your thesis that war is for losers is 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 that that's uh, I mean that's a modern phenomenon, right? Because during World War One, for example, uh, back when everyone thought World War was you know the coolest thing in the world, uh, a huge portion right. of the male population signed up, and it was actually the upper classes I think more likely to be killed. There was a lot of officers and generals. I don't know about generals, but a lot of officers being killed uh, in the UK and and elsewhere. Uh, so is, is this is this a modern phenomenon? Basically, once intellectual opinion turns against war, war becomes yeah. for losers. But it wasn't always it wasn't always for losers. I mean, there were people who weren't losers who were who were into fighting war. Uh, but that but that ended sometime in the last century or so. Yeah, well, what you had is this rise of the idea that international war is stupid. Uh, it was, as I pointed out, 
basically really taking fire after World War II, after World War I, and then, of course, uh, being reified by World War II. So we've now had this period of time in which no European has been involved in a war for 75 years, an international war in, in, in Europe. Uh, and other countries have, you know, there's been, there have been wars between Israel and the Arab states and between uh, Pakistan and India and so forth. But those have mostly died out as well. So the situation, and it's very unwaltzian, is um, we're living in a condition, I hate to use, I hesitate to use this word, of a culture of peace in which people still have plenty of problems, countries have plenty of problems, but they don't use war, direct war, against each other to solve them. And so it's sort of anarchic because there isn't any real world government there. Um, Policing the situation is basically a collegial uh, and competitive uh, community of, you know, 89 or 100, uh, uh, 200 uh, uh, independent sovereign states. Um, they, uh, in that situation, it's very, it's basically you, you try to work things out. Uh, one thing you might want to do is figure out about international trade. Well, if you got a condition of international peace, in other words, you don't think you're going to have to go to war with somebody, you might go over there and say, Hey, have you got something you want to sell? Or maybe you want to buy, or maybe I'll invest. If you're not going to worry about being at war with them in the next 10, 20 years, uh, it facilitates international trade. Uh, you also have to believe that inter- international trade is a good idea, rather than autarky, for example. Mm-hmm. It may also help with um, um, uh, democracy promotion, that if you're not worried about getting international wars, probably the idea that you can have a democracy uh, rises some and you don't need a strong man to protect you from an outside enemy. <clears throat> it also means that military forces are not very important. Uh, they're not going to be you. They might be some limited areas where you might want to keep some and you might want to hedge against the rise of however unlikely of another Hitler, for example. But you don't need very you don't you don't need a whole lot of them. Uh, and anarchy in many respects might be a good thing. Instead of having a government that decides everything, you have these various bilateral and multilateral agreements. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes you have, uh, you know, people getting away with 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 a, a a really good deal and sometimes not but generally speaking you know you got problems with fisheries you got who you can where can you fish uh and whose 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 waters are those well you work it out it's taken decades it's taken decades for international trade to increase but it has increased and so um it may be that's a pretty good way to run things you don't have to worry about war and having a, a culture of peace in that sense um, may be uh, better than having a real world government that can that can bring down the slammer at various times. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's 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 all. Uh, that's and all. It, you, you've used the word anachronism. <laughs> uh, I think that's right. You know, war has sort of become an anachronism. We just don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think you're generally there's still civil wars and other problems. Of, of course, yeah, and I, yeah, I think I, you know, I, I, I'm very, I mean, attracted to this uh, explanation. I still want there to be some kind of material uh, explanation, and I think, I think there are, there is, but I think in the, the general terms of just people are not doing this anymore. I think, I think you're right, and they're not doing it for for good reasons. I think that's also correct. Um, you know, I think what we should we should talk about finally, I mean, I'll, I'll let you go after this, but um, the uh, the U.S. and um, the U.S. China relationship. So there seems to be it seems to be that the U.S. Um, foreign policy uh, focus tends to it, it almost needs it needs something to keep justifying doing what we're doing. So I've noticed that as terrorism has died down, uh, there's been a lot more bipartisan, mostly Republican, but also uh, to a certain extent the Democrats, really really uh, uh, scaremongering about China. Uh, seeing it as a major threat to the United States, what's what's the case for complacency with regards to the rise of China? Well, there's not much you can do about it. I'm just uh, I've read your paper on China and I've used it a lot in a paper, paper I'm just finishing now, just coming out of copy editing. We published at Cato Institute as a policy analysis paper. Um, uh, it basically uh, China is not a threat, the, and the issue basically, you know, almost all my work has been where are the threats. Well, China is a threat in the sense that it might be able to steal some intellectual property. It may be able to propagandize the way you don't like. It may get more influence in one place or another. 
but it's not a Hitlerian threat. It does want to take over territory, except obviously for the issue of Taiwan, which is sort of, which it should be kept in mind. And the same with the Soviet, with, the, with Russia. Uh, they're basically content with what they've got. They want to build up their economies. They want to grow. They want to become more prosperous. Unfortunately, neither country seems to be going in the direction of becoming more free, which is going to, I think, get in the way of a lot of things. But it seems to me complacency is the best thing uh, in that they, they do not present a problem that requires, there's no military solution to the problems that they uh, present. Uh, and I think basically uh, dealing with them in a, uh, uh, just sort of treating them for what they are, complaining about the fact that they're, you know, there's uh, civil rights violations, though we should also talk about civil rights violations in other countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, is perfectly okay. Um, if they are not reliable international partners, then don't deal with them. Uh, but for the most part, they don't present a threat. They want, they both, both countries want to be bigger players on the international stage. Okay, well, let's, you know, they're, they're, they're entitled. Um, China, particularly because of its. Isn't Putin running our large. elections? And yeah, that's fine. If you want to sort you know, we, we should have more people subverting our elections. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it adds a little color. Um, look, the elections are basically wall-to-wall -wall fake news anyway, as, as incumbents lie about their record and as their opponents lie about their opponents' record, you know, whatever. Sure. Uh, people are always hyping and saying, you know, showing pictures of them with their family and their dog and everything. Um, and so what is happening is that other countries have been able to uh, toss in, to add to the pile of bull, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, and it, it, the elections are that they're basically uh, people you know filled with hype and and uh, and uh, exaggeration and so forth and and this is just adds a little bit to it. So I'm not I've got a section particularly in the uh, in the book about Russia and its intervention in 2014, and it was basically uh, chicken fat. Uh, they. Uh, my, the best evidence about elections is that campaigning doesn't make much difference anyway. And they did very little. You know, they tried to put some tweets in and stuff like that and spread some rumors and so forth. And people who wanted to believe them, believed them. People who didn't want to believe them, didn't believe them. And I don't think they made much difference anyway in terms of the outcome one way or the other. So if they, if they, uh, it's not clear to me why foreigners shouldn't be able to intervene in other foreigners' elections. And particularly since the United States has been so strongly doing that for so many years, yeah. it scores maybe hundreds of foreign elections the United States has intervened in. So it's it's very hypocritical this whole discussion in many respects. But there are places where international cooperation with these guys, these two big powers, um, uh, makes sense. For example, one of the problems now, terrible humanitarian problem, is is surviving, getting out of and uh, mellowing the effects of the Syrian war. It seems to me the United States should be working with the Russians on that. The Russians would probably be, they don't want this war to be there. They've, they've, of course, their side is one, Assad. Uh, but, um, anything is better than this, this continued civil war. And, uh, we're now sort of maybe in the aftermath and uh, working together with the international community, particularly the United States working with Russia it would make sense. Another big problem is Afghanistan. Um, exactly where that's going to go. Now, neither the Russians nor the Chinese want an unstable, or nor the Pakistanis, nor the Indians, nor the Iranians want an unstable Afghanistan. They'd like to be really dull, boring, old-fashioned. If it's democratic, that's okay. If it's not democratic, that's okay. If it's got a dictator, that's okay. Just be stable. Uh, because they're all afraid of Islamist terrorism that could come out of that in one form or other. Uh, the, the Russians, of course, with their... Uh, with their uh, Chechnya and so forth. And the, uh, the, the uh, Chinese are absolutely paranoid about what's going on in Xinjiang and so forth and the danger of Muslims. Anyway, the point is that there's, there's a lot of agreement. Everybody wants a stable Afghanistan. So having bringing those guys in to help you with Afghanistan strikes me as a really good idea. Maybe it won't work. Lots of things don't work. But I would certainly give it a try. If it means that they get to struggle a little bit more and say, boy, we're really important because we helped solve the problem in Afghanistan, sounds fine to me. Um, the, uh, beyond that, there's, you know, economic issues. And, uh, as long as people aren't using war to deal with them, 
uh, you just let it, let them go. You know, you you make deals, you don't make deals. You sometimes get uh, get, get snookered. Sometimes you don't get snookered. Uh, you sometimes poach fish. Somebody poaches fishes from you, fish from you. You you get a law of the sea uh, and try to work that out. The United States, of course, has not ratified the one that's there, but maybe it could get around to doing that. At any rate, it's a situation like that. It seems to me there's there's rough things around the edges, intervening in other people's civil wars, lobbying cyber balloons, um, and uh, causing problems of that. And, and uh, uh, the, um, frequently minor little incursions at, at borders that don't cause wars. They're, they're basically what uh, I don't know if you know Dan Altman has done a really good article on this at Georgia State, pointing out there's been a lot of border conflicts, but they've become, they basically, people are slicing off tiny bits of territory of other countries, but ones that don't have people in them and are not garrison. Well, we can live with that. It's not, <laughs> we can deal with it. So I think it was in pretty good shape in that sense overall. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, yeah, the Syrian, you mentioned the Syrian conflict and ending it. I, yeah, I've written, I've written on that. It's really heartbreaking because the U S for political reasons, because it had its heart set on overthrowing Assad, the fact that they haven't succeeded means basically that they're going to leave the troops there, keep the civil war simmering, and basically be sanctioning that country until the end of time. Just be, you know, and, and, and that's just yeah, right. that's just the inertia. It's crazy. Yeah. It it, it, basically, I was writing at least in 2014. Uh, uh, Dobbins of the Rand Corporation, um, Jim Dobbins, led a group which was basically saying about the Syrian war at that time: anything is better than this war which means letting Assad win is better. Yeah. And the, both, both in Libya, as well as in, uh, <laughs> or rather in Yemen, as well as in Syria, has been that those, those are bad civil wars, but they would have ended had it not been the intervention of outside countries. They perpetuated and the, the catastrophes are, are huge. They, you know, humanitarian disaster, anything would be better. Anything, including Assad. We'd be really nice if we could have a nice Jefferson democracy and so forth. Uh, but the war is worse than uh, anything, including having it being run by Assad yeah. or some, somebody else like that. Yeah. And the, yeah, and the paper, I mean, the paper I wrote in Survival is also, if you're only concerned about atrocities committed by Assad or a dictator, when do states commit atrocities tends to be when they're threatened. So you're, you're not getting that benefit either. You're getting a civil war and you're getting a more brutal government and you're getting anarchy on top of it. And you're right. It's pretty much always better to just end the war. Yeah, And, and you, get, you get in the case of Syria, of course, not only is it disastrous on the ground, but then you have this massive flow of refugees, which destabilizes other countries. And uh, all these people, you know, if they'd just been able to stay home, even under the tender mercies of Assad, um, they would have been much better off. Yeah, we're we're on the same page there. Let me ask you this: You're uh, you're uh, uh, we haven't talked about your uh, work on uh, public opinion, but you you've done a lot of work on American public opinion and war. I've always thought that the U.S. has a lot of security guarantees. So of course, to NATO, uh, it's there's a strategic what we call strategic ambiguity with Taiwan. Some people have been there have been talks of possibly changing that, and the U.S. giving Taiwan a security guarantee. Um, when the rubber hits the road, we've never been tested on one of these one of these uh, uh, commitments. Uh, do you think that the U.S. I mean, if it really came down to it, even on paper, if, if Russia say had a war with Estonia or Latvia or China invaded Taiwan, let's say if we got rid of even if we got rid of strategic ambiguity, we gave them a, some kind of formal uh, declaration that we would uh, we would uh, come to their aid. Do you think American public opinion would stand for that, or is is it are, are they are American leaders just uh, writing checks that they can't cash? You know, they, they're writing checks, but not necessarily signing them. In a lot of cases, um, yeah, I, I, I think um, you know, there's a thing I, I call the uh, the Iraq syndrome, <clears throat> and I think uh, you know, you remember one time Obama was going to uh, had a red line about chemical use of chemical weapons in Syria. Right. If they cross that red line, he didn't quite in these words, but we'll be coming in with guns blazing. Well, there was a chemical attack and he didn't do anything. And the reason he didn't do anything, he had, he had for, at first support from uh, the Republicans as well, in the Congress and so forth on, on, on not going in in terms of fighting a war, but at least uh, bombing retaliation. Um, and they went home and talked to their constituents, both Republicans and Democrats, came back to Washington and say, there's no stomach for that. 
and he never did it. And Congress never, of course, never authorized it. So I think in the case, if there's an attack on Taiwan, I can imagine the United States getting involved with, you know, harassing, supporting uh, resistance within the country and so forth, uh, but not probably that much more. And the same with if Russia basically invades Estonia. Um, uh, it, I just don't think there's going to be much stomach for getting into war that, nor getting into war over submerged rocks in the South China Sea. Uh, they're claimed both by Japan and China and other countries. Um, so, um, I, but I don't think, I mean, Putin has been asked about, what, you know, attacking Estonia. He said, nobody's stupid. <laughs> um, uh, in, in other words, it's not, the, the, the situation in, in, in uh, and I think he's right, I think he's being sincere in that case. Um, I, the situation in Ukraine was extremely unusual. Yeah. It was part of the Soviet Union. There was this, the, the uh, Black Sea Fleet there and so forth. Uh, and it was seen to be a potentially Russian, anti-Russian uh, fanatics taking over. That's the way they looked at it. Now, I just don't think that that's, that, that was taken in, 19, in 2014 to be a, a harbinger of things to happen. And I think that's not the case at all. And I, I don't know about Taiwan. Uh, Xi Jinping seems to want to take it back. He's talking a little bit brusquely about even using military and so forth. But the difficulty would be extremely high. Uh, Michael Beckley's book uh, called Unrivaled has a, has a good discussion of this. Um, it's uh, amphibious landings are extremely difficult. There's only a few places where you can land, uh, uh, like 14 or something in the whole country of Taiwan. Um, and there would be harassment of the ships coming in. There'd be carnage on the ground as the uh, uh, Taiwanese defended themselves. And there'd also be, as happened after Crimea, uh, a big backlash against China uh, in terms of trade and so forth, various kinds of sanctions or just not wanting to deal with them anymore. Yeah. So I think it's likely to keep China in its in its box. They have mostly talked over the over the decades about this is a long term problem. We've worked out agreements with various you know other countries in terms of borders, border conflicts, do a dozen or more countries uh, over the years, and uh, eventually. Um, we'll work it out. And I think mostly it's, it's good that even though there's been a lot of war talk now lately in Washington uh, about uh, defending Taiwan, I don't think it's uh, the Taiwanese. They're just a thing in the New York Times this morning. In fact, the Taiwanese, if you ask them, say, nah, there's no problem. And I think they're probably right. Yeah. Yeah. I think if, if China was going to eventually take Taiwan, I, I think amphibious landing would be the most difficult way to do it. I think you would do it with probably uh, some kind of blockade and maybe maybe some air power. Uh, but I don't know why China would do that today, given that China still is a middle income country and still is uh, rising economically. So, I, you know, I think the power disparity is going to be uh, hard to overcome and put their mind on taking Taiwan eventually. It's it's a, it's 22 million versus 1.4 billion, and the 1.4 billion has a higher growth rate. Um, and so it's it, it's hard it's hard to imagine Taiwan if China wants it staying its independence. But like you know, yeah, like, it, would just, it would just be terribly destructive and absurd from China's yeah. standpoint. Yeah. It, it it would, yeah. I that's think, I think they, that's an act. Of, they still do want to take Taiwan back, so there's no question about that. Uh, yeah, if you want to take look in the long term. If uh, and it is no nothing, this is nothing I'm seeing over the horizon. It's way over the horizon. But if China actually became a real democracy, viable one, uh, you can imagine Taiwan joining voluntarily. Um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. I can assure you. Um, but uh, and maybe it's a pipe dream. Uh, but uh, it's it's a, it's a plausible plausible one, for at least in the long term. Sure. <clears throat> So yeah, so um, okay. Well, I mean, it was it's been it's been great talking to you, John. I mean, I, I big fan of your work, so I'm glad we got to talk. You know, I recommend everyone read uh, the stupidity of war. Uh, I also recommend everyone read the uh, uh, banality of ethnic of ethnic conflict. Uh, you know, it's just a very entertaining uh, paper. You, you, you people, you know, I don't think are gonna. It's dark, but it's also entertaining. I mean, the uh, uh, you have characters there, former bodybuilders, former pimps, just being uh, you know high high level commanders in this uh, in Serbia and Serbia Kosovo. I mean, it's really it's really just an incredible story. And all your other work too, I recommend reading. Is there anywhere on? Are you on social media? Is there anywhere where people could keep up with you? 
Uh, well, I, I, I've avoided social media since I have enough trouble just keeping up with email. But uh, my email address is online. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, so at, at either uh, Cato uh, or at um, at Ohio State. So if people have questions and stuff, I'd love to love to converse that way. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much, John. Okay, thank you, Richard. Great talking with you.